Recently I've found myself in some pretty ridiculous circumstances. Circumstances that bring to mind the theory of the butterfly effect. The idea that small, seemingly trivial events may ultimately result in something with much larger consequences. Now remember that for later. Now, I currently find myself in a position building one of the most exhilarating race cars on the planet and soon competing in a national championship. And so I got to thinking, what were these small, trivial events that led me to this very moment? And I think it started with this. I'm Daniel Ricardo, and I'm a car mechanic. A few days after binging the first season of Drive to Survive, the life-altering, poor decision-making continued when I found myself explaining to mum why there was a go-kart parked in her garage. Now, you would think that it couldn't get any worse, but as you already know from the title of the video, it did. So I quit my job to pursue this radical thing called motorsport. I handed over my convincing resume to Hyperacer and landed myself a job building these cars. I was quite happy just partaking in club level karting events on the weekend. I even managed to take home some decent silverware while I was at it. But I guess that ending would have been monotonous at best, because on an otherwise uneventful Friday morning, some idiot decided to give me a go in a Hyper Racer X1. This led me to ignore any rational financial decision and go all in to build myself my very own X1. So you probably want to know, what's a Hyper Racer? Well, let me show you. Let me introduce you to John and Dean Crook. The father and son duo wanted to go open wheeler racing on a modest budget. F3 and F4 in Australia have been practically non-existent for some time, but will still run you around $15,000 per round. You heard me correctly, $15,000 per round. So they designed and built this, the Hyper Racer X1. A Hayabusa powered space frame design covered in carbon fiber bodywork. An amazing feat of design and engineering on its own, an absolute masterpiece when 20 of them race against each other in a national category. Remember that $15,000 for an F4 round I mentioned earlier? Well that's good enough for an entire season of national level racing in a Hyper Racer. So now that you know how I got here and what we're doing, let's start building the chassis for this thing. Now while I'm well versed in the assembly of these cars from start to finish, I'm not all that handy on the torch. So we're going to need to get ourselves a welder. This guy should do the trick. So this is the main jig. It looks like a mess to the untrained eye, but you'll see how it all comes together soon enough. The chassis starts with the main rails. You got the top and the bottom. But do you see all of that intricate bending? That all used to be done by hand and was incredibly time consuming. But now, thanks to CNC tube bending, a batch of bent main rails is just one phone call from being replenished. Pretty neat. Once all of the top main rails have been installed, the rear needs to be cut so they meet up together nicely. Once the same is done on the other side, these get TIG welded into position. The bottom main rails are a little easier as they just get cut to meet up with the bulkheads. Speaking of, the next part to be added to the chassis is the front and rear bulkhead. This allows us to mount various components such as the wishbones, steering rack, battery compartment, and so on. To hold these main rails in place, we need to make the cross rails that sit horizontally in the chassis. Previously, these were notched by hand with the Bosch angle grinder, which was about as efficient as Alonzo's 2015 McLaren engine. But now we have this. A plasma tube notching machine. This machine uses a chuck as the X axis and moves the cutting torch along the Y axis. This means that I just need to draw a flat plane DXF file of the tube that I want to cut. I had to do this with every tube, but once it was done, it allowed us to cut five cars worth of chassis tubes in a single day. Now that's efficient. Next, we need some protection. The front and rear roll hoops are CNC bent, just like the main rails we talked about earlier. However, this means that the notches must be done by hand to fit the jig because, well, as much as I wanted it to, the bent tube wasn't going in this chuck. 
The front roll hoop also allows us to mount the adjustable steering column mount because being able to turn in a race car is pretty handy I guess. Additionally, we can add the rear roll hoop support so that we're fully FIA compliant with this chassis. Which leads us into adding a few of the side braces before removing this outer part of the jig and revealing all of the fabrication we've completed thus far. And before you know it, this thing's starting to look like a real race car chassis. Now, torsional stiffness in a race car chassis makes it more predictable to drive. It also prevents the car from folding up like an omelette, which is good, I guess. So let's give the chassis some torsional stiffness by fabricating the front and rear cross braces. On the topic of stiffness and safety, we're going to add even more triangular tubing to the side of the chassis. You've probably noticed this gaping hole in the rear of the chassis. Now while I'm sure that you know the engine and transmission reside in this area, we still want to add some rigidity to this area as well as having something for the engine to mount to. These engine bars are bent in-house and then welded into the chassis, rounding out the rear shape of the car. Now, I've skipped over this whole front section that you can see on the screen. This section houses the front bell cranks, sway bars and shock that are very unique to the X1, but more importantly, far more easily explained in a future episode where I install all of the suspension components and explain how they work. You'll want to subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss out, and while you're at it, like the video too. But getting back to the chassis, we've also gone ahead and added the same components to the rear, including the sway bar mounts and bell crank mounts. Before we can remove the chassis from the jig table, we can go ahead and add the remaining jigged parts to the chassis, such as the suspension pickup tabs and engine mount bosses. It's finally time to remove our chassis from the jig table and fabricate the final piece of the puzzle, the skid rails. This is the lowest section of the chassis which gives the driver somewhere to sit. The rails are CNC bent just like before which makes things really easy and they fit up perfectly after each end is notched to suit the chassis rail. And that's really it. Doesn't this thing just look absolutely incredible? But there's more work to be done. After the chassis gets powder coated, there's one last critical component that gets installed to call this thing a Hyper Racer X1 chassis. These are the carbon Kevlar side intrusion panels which serve multiple purposes. They add stiffness to the chassis and they prevent someone else's wishbone from ending up in your lap or through your leg. Anyways, if you've made it all the way to the end of the video, thanks so much for watching and I can't wait to release the next episode where we start building this car and get one step closer to driving it.